It's My Nerd World, and welcome to it, a Star Wars podcast. On the show this week, The Rise of Skywalker wins some awards. Yes, that's right. Also, other podcasts complain about the sequels. Now, I'm fine with people having their own opinion. However, if you're going to complain about films, you know, make sure that you're not being hypocritical about it. I'll explain. We have a little bit of Ahsoka live action series shooting news, some listener feedback, including some very unreleased, bizarre Star Wars products that I have a hard time believing are actually real. I've included a link in the notes for today's podcast if you want to check it out for yourself. In the meantime, let's go ahead and get right to it. I am so glad that you are with the show this week. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. It's a Star Wars podcast here on My Nerd World, and I'm your host, John Justice. Glad you're with the show again this week. Remember, for all things My Nerd World and Embark, the science fiction space opera series written by the voice you're hearing right now, head on over to MyNerdWorld.net. I've made uh, some uh, some changes to uh, several different posts there, done some updating on the website. You definitely want to go and check that out, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the show. Not a ton of uh, news this week, so this is probably going to be a relatively short episode. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get to the news that we do have. We are the spark that will light the fire that'll burn the first order down. From Deadline.com, the 46th annual Saturn Awards, which uh, Saturn Awards, if I can speak appropriately, which celebrate the best in genre entertainment, were handed out Tuesday night in Los Angeles with Star Wars garnering seven prizes across such properties as Disney and Lucasfilms, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, Disney XD animated series The Clone Wars, and Disney Plus The Mandalorian. The best science fiction film, Rise of Skywalker, was one of several movies from last year's award season that were included this year after the eligibility per- uh, period was extended to run from July 15th of 2019 through November 15th of 2020 and allowed streaming and um, video-on-demand entrance into the film categories. So here are the re- uh, the, the respective awards that The Rise of Skywalker won. Uh, best Director, J.J. Abrams. Best Music, uh, John Williams. Uh, best Makeup, Amanda Knight and Neil Scanlon. And uh, Best... Special effects, Roger Goyette, Neil Scanlon, Patrick Tubach, and uh, Toby Tahui, all for uh, all for The Rise of Skywalker. I have, you know, not made it a secret at all how much I love this film. It is still currently my favorite Star Wars movie. I actually sat down and watched it um, this week, and it was an interesting juxtaposition in my sci-fi viewing Uh, lately i've been watching more heady sci-fi i've seen dune now a couple of times uh once in the theater and a couple times at home on hbo max um my wife and i have as i've mentioned been watching isaac asimov's foundation on uh, apple tv and i can't say enough good things about that program um and those are slower paced again more more sort of heavy science fiction in terms of the of the themes. So sitting down and watching the rise of Skywalker, it was another one of the of of these just really enjoyable experiences. They are different types of science fiction. You know, George Lucas's A New Hope, right? Star Wars A New Hope, the first one, was probably closer in line with Dune, right? 
pacing was faster, but it's clear once you've read or seen Dune what George lifted from that film and added to Star Wars. You know, he created more of a more of a uh, uh, of an acceptable um accessible um piece of sci-fi entertainment than what those books prior to the films um had had done. And that has continued throughout the you know, throughout the series and all of the other pieces of animation, live action, you know, movie content that we've that we've, you know, been blessed to get since then. And again, The Rise of Skywalker is just a I keep wanting like my mind keeps going to crackling yarn, but that's but that's not right. It's just a science fiction adventure. And for me personally, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this here in in just a moment, it does fit in nicely with the other two films in the in the sequel trilogy. As I've mentioned um on recent episodes, I've been uh, listening to the the Sith Council. Um, Christian Harloff uh, is a fairly well known podcaster. Does a competition, pop culture competition show, the Schmodown, um, and you know he he is within YouTube and the podcasting world a fairly well known, probably mid thirties commentator and personality, and has had several different Star Wars podcasts throughout the years. And more recently, he has Sith Council. Um, I just stumbled across it and happened to stumble across um, them, that podcast, going through every single one of the Star Wars saga films, much in the same way I did about a, about a year ago. Modeled off of, I think, much in the same way mine was as well, uh, the rewatchables on the, on the Ringer Network. So they've just landed on the sequel trilogy. And it was really fascinating to listen to, they have two other guests on the show. It was really fascinating to listen to Christian Harloff and his complaints over The Force Awakens. And it wasn't, they weren't complaints based off of The Force Awakens. He likes that film, but they were complaints based off of what he thought was a poor execution in The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker that didn't pay off from what was set up in The Force Awakens. And it was another one of these moments, and I'm just going to grab two little items because I don't want to wipe out on this. But it was another one of these moments where I'm listening to this particular individual of whom I, you know, I respect his opinion, and everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But it was this nitpicking that didn't really make sense when you go and compare it to the original trilogy, meaning the original trilogy, if you're going to be consistent and not hypocritical, has the same issues if that is your beef that the sequel issues have. So let me give you one beyond Christian Harloff that I've mentioned on the show. A lot of people complained about the treatment of Rose in The Rise of Skywalker versus The Last Jedi. And the point that I've made in the past is, again, you may not like that she didn't have that she had a smaller role in The Rise of Skywalker, but you can say exactly the same thing about Yoda in the original trilogy. Yoda had a much larger role in The Empire Strikes Back, became a pivotal figure in the franchise later on down the road. But in the in Return of the Jedi, he has a very small role. And as a matter of fact, when you line up the time spent on screen between Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back and Yoda in, in Return of the Jedi, it almost matches up with the time spent on screen of Rose and the time spent on screen in of in the last jedi and rose's time spent on screen in the in the rise of skywalker so a couple of complaints that christian harloff had and then i'll dive into why i think this happens now more than it did in the past one of his biggest complaints uh christian harloff's complaints about the the force awakens was you know the the setups that don't pay off with finn you know, Finn is teased as this hero in The Force Awakens, and yet he doesn't turn out to be uh, much of one later on. Well, I just completely disagree with that. He does end up tapping into the Force in The Rise of Skywalker. He does have a large role inside The Last Jedi to the point where he actually has his own singular battle with Captain Phasma. That's fantastic. And again, everybody's entitled to their to their opinion. Uh, he talks about you know the the setups between Kylo Ren and Rey, comments that are made. Well, let me go back to Finn. This is a better example. You know, he talks about Finn being 
a um, you know the showing the picture of him as a child on the on the Star Destroyer at the beginning of the film and how he was taken from his family at an early age to become a stormtrooper. Well, again, that does pay off later on. It pays off in the Rise of Skywalker when J.J. Abrams partners him up with Jonna, and you find out that the people that are on Kef Burr or is that Kef Burr? The people that are on the 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 on, on the on, on the planet adjacent to Endor. I think it's Kepper, um, are actually former stormtroopers themselves, right? Uh, and when you talk about things not paying off, how many things inside of, you know, the original Star Wars didn't pay off until later on? You know, the Clone Wars. Going off the example of things being set up and not paying off, if you're just looking at three films, you could easily make the same argument, well, that was mentioned in... A New Hope about the Clone Wars when Obi-Wan Kenobi is talking with Luke about um, Darth Vader, right? And yet we don't hear about it ever again. Well, we do way on way later down the line. In my opinion, and again, going to be consistent. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But in my opinion, the sequel trilogy is actually very consistent in the way that it's laid out with the original trilogy. It's fascinating to me too because the sequel tri- the prequel trilogy never gets mentioned in these types of complaints because that storyline between that arc as I've always said those three films are the most cohesive of all of the of all of the trilogies. There was one particular one that really made me laugh that Christian Harloff made though. And then I'll tell you why I think this is happening. Um he got all up in arms because he's like, you know, here they they had Star Killer base and they blow it up at the end of of The Force Awakens and yet when we get into the last Jedi they're now on the run. Well, why are they on the run if they just achieved this victory? I'm going to let that sit for a minute just to see if you can guess what I'm going to say next. That's exactly the same thing. That's exactly the same thing. I won't whisper. That's exactly the same thing that happened in A New Hope and the Empire Strikes Back. Now, you can make a complaint that it's too derivative. However, if you're t- just talking about the storyline that doesn't make sense to you with that regard, well, you know, I'm here to tell you that guess what? That's exactly the same thing that that that, that happens in, in in between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. They blow up the Death Star, they win, but yet in the second movie, you know, everything goes to hell in the handbasket. That's why it's called the 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 Empire Strikes Back. So why do I think this is happening? You know, why why do we get complaints like this and why is it? You know, I mean, there's complaints. You can talk about jokes that don't land, you can talk about milking space cows, you can talk about Luke's um, where Luke is in the film, if you don't like it. Those are all valid complaints, but it's the hypocritical ones that kind of drive me nuts because if you're going to make those comparisons, then you need to go back to the original films, and especially Return of the Jedi. Speaking of derivative, they have another Death Star at the end of the third film. Anyway, um, if you're going to be consistent and not hypocritical, you need to be able to point those things out. But why is that? Well, there's a reverence that people have to the original trilogy. And... Back when the original trilogy came out, and even for individuals that are probably 10, 15 years younger than I am, um, they knew those films still as children, right? Or young, you know, they were introduced to them at a younger age. Those films got a pass. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have social networking. We didn't have podcasting. These were conversations that we just had, even with people that are younger than I am, that were introduced to the films, to the original trilogy long after right, um, long after they were released, you didn't have this ability to go and podcast and share your opinion or put it out there on Twitter and have it reinforced by other individuals. I don't believe as a species, as human beings, that we were ever meant to be as connected as we are. And we talk about this quite a bit on the, the radio show um, that, I, that I co-host uh, for, my full-time, for my full-time job. And I really do think that if it, ha- if it, if it wasn't for social networking, and there's good, there's good things to it, or podcasting, and obviously I love podcasting, right? I think it's great. I really do think that people would be a lot less critical over these films and be, um, you know, uh, sort of take them more at face value and just enjoy them for for what they are. But as I've said all along, you know, hey, uh, everybody is uh, entitled to to their to their opinion. The hyperdrive is leaking. This doesn't really fall into a leaking category. However, this is a podcast that is mentioning this, but apparently Rosario Dawson, who will be playing the live-action Ahsoka, as she did in The Mandalorian Season 2, is uh, going to be filming for Star Wars in December. This is according to Mark Berna, uh, Bernadin uh, during the Fat Man Beyond podcast, the podcast he co-hosts with Kevin Smith. 
uh, that he uh, wanted to, uh, he said during the podcast that he wanted to cast Rosario Dawson in his short film shooting this December, but couldn't because she'll be busy filming, filming Star Wars in Manhattan Beach, of all places. I'm assuming they're building volumes all around the country, right? The uh, the stages and the sets that they use with the LED screen, um, like they did for The Mandalorian and like they are doing for the Obi-Wan Kenobi live action series. So either the Ahsoka show is starting production sooner than we thought, and not early 2022, like the Hollywood Reporter said last week, or she's in Mandalorian season three, currently filming in uh, in Manhattan Beach. Oh, and I took that. I said Manhattan Beach. I was thinking Manhattan, New York. Duh. Manhattan Beach is where the main volume is right now, where they shoot the Mandalorian. Uh, so you know, just a bit of shooting news. We're gonna have so much Star Wars next year, man. Um, I uh. I simply, uh, I, I simply cannot wait, right? Uh, I'm really looking forward to the holiday season, uh, but man, we're going to have a ton of Star Wars next year. All right, here's an odd one for you. Now, before we dive into listener feedback. This is not going to go the way you think. So a listener came across this. Matt Cussler says, I came across this tonight, thought you might find it interesting, provided you haven't seen it before. So this comes from art uh, uh, art art-sheep.com. I'm having a hard time believing that this exists. Unreleased, bizarre Star Wars products that feature an enema set, among others. So the article goes like this. You know how the industry works. Every successful saga comes with a series of products, from shirts to miniatures to beachwear to chocolate. Famous for its many uh, for its many series of products, Star Wars was one of the first to capitalize on its merchandising potential by producing desirable limited edition toys. Almost 40 years later, we expect to find some rare gems um, as such, like the one-to-one scale functioning Death Star that can now reach up to upwards of $114 billion at auction. What we never expected to find, um, and this is a British, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a British um, article, right? So looking at these, these are, these are uh, United Kingdom pro- or British products. What we never expected, it was a series of medical Star Wars merchandise, including an enema set. As found on the Scarfolk blog, the, there was a catheter that was one of only the of the many Star Wars products. Back in 1977, Scarfolk Med- Medical Supplies uh, Limited in England desperately wanted to get in on the Star Wars bandwagon and prepared a pitch for a series of potential tie-in products aimed at sick and other feeble citizens, right, who are a drain on the NHS resources. In addition to the products, mock-ups posted above and below and i'm looking at the photos of these right now uh there were also darth vader oxygen masks for asthmatics x-wing x-ray machines sith bedpans and chewbacca toupees even the slogan for the promotional catalog reads use the forceps sms were also very keen to tap the enormously valuable a valuable post-life demographic. For patients who didn't survive their medical conditions, there were mortuary items such as Greedo body bags, Jedi embalming materials, and R2-D2 urns, all of which ensured that even after death, it was impossible to escape the exploitation by the movie brand. And I'm not kidding you. I'm looking. This looks like the actual artwork of what you would have seen back in 1977, R2-D2 catheter. And there's a little catheter that's got an R2-D2 cap on the end of it. I I guess it's real, man, but holy cow, I've never seen anything like that before. I included a link if you want to check it out for yourself. It's in the show notes. So if you go into the show notes and you want to go and and take a look at these items for yourself, uh, go for it. You can find them there in the links, but it is just, I've... Now, now, when it comes to Star Wars, I think I, I have honestly seen it all. I need someone to show me my place in all this. All right, we got a couple of items for listener feedback this week. First one comes uh, from a friend of the show, Shlomo. Excellent episode. Your listener feedback portion always features such brilliant and insightful commentary. He is uh, being silly because he messages me often, and I appreciate his sense of humor. Friend of the show, Miranda Alisa. 
says this. Here's something I want to say about the future of Star Wars with any content that they will get out going forward as a word of advice. When it comes to the process of storytelling, the preparations, drafting, editing, bringing in the structure of sequences, planning, outlining, organizing, ultimately getting into the transition of really stretching out the imagination, including the world building and bringing them all together in fruition and giving it a a strong ebb and flow built with intention and creativity. Star Wars needs to have freedom. There needs to be freedom in the way it gets made, the way it is written, crafted, drafted, and outlined. There needs to be a freedom for both studios to really go above and beyond and blossom into this galaxy wherever it leads and wherever it takes to be appealing enough to attract audiences' uh, interest uh, that's just uh, that isn't just the fandom. Um, yeah, I tend to agree with that. And this isn't necessarily a complaint. It's just a... Um, just an observation as we wrap the show up this week and something that I've that that I've thought about quite a bit when it comes to when it comes to Star Wars content being created. Uh I really wish that Lucasfilm had um still had a singular person at the helm with the vision, right? I love what they have done with the content that we've received. Disney has. And I think that given the fact that George is not directly involved anymore, they've used some incredibly talented individuals and done an amazing job creating content. Um, I love the vast majority, if not all, in some way, shape, or form. Unless the stuff that's, you know... I do. I really do love the majority of what Disney has put out. in, In one way or another. But... And I've talked about this on past shows. I really hope that there will be a an individual like a Dave Filoni who can guide things overall into the future. Um, the way it seems right now, it seems to be working. There seems to be a sto- the, the, the story group that seems to handle making sure that there's continuity among all the different pro- uh, projects. And then you have what's happening in live action that seems to be led mostly by John Favreau and Dave Filoni. But when it comes to the films, you can look at a Kathleen Kennedy, right, as being sort of the George Lucas. But I think while she's done a fantastic job as a producer, there still needs to be somebody at the at the helm. And perhaps moving forward as, as they look at doing more trilogies, we'll get that. I, I talked a long time ago about how Ryan Johnson to do a trilogy, to have one person in charge of a singular trilogy, even if other directors are involved, would be a really, really good move. Almost like he could play George Lucas to a set of films that fit within the continuity of the larger Star Wars. Um, That's not to say that I don't like what they did with, with the... I do. I love the sequel trilogy. But getting back to what Miranda said, I think that's where Disney and Lucasfilm can really can really benefit in the future of Star Wars storytelling. Now, and, and, but also, they may be doing that more so than I myself even 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 realize. Um, and again, I've really really enjoyed the content they've put out. And when it comes to the Book of Boba Fett, which we should be getting a trailer here in the next week or so, Disney Day coming up on November fourth, right? Is that next week? So we should get a trailer for the Book of Boba Fett. We know we're getting a special for that. And then heading in the next year with Andor. Uh, Mandalorian season three, another season of Bad Batch and Obi-Wan Kenobi. There'll be plenty of commentary like this about how Disney continues to do when it comes to telling their stories from a galaxy far, far away. All right, that wraps up the show this week. Before I go, I want to invite you to head on over to MyNerdWorld.net or Amazon.com and search for John J.O.N. Justice and check out my Embark Science Fiction series if you haven't so far. Katha has found something and humanity won't survive without it. The stars are now within reach as global corporations D-Corp and Intercon have made interstellar travel possible and spaceflight available to all humanity. But when an industrial accident inside D-Corp sets off an apocalyptic chain of events, all of Earth is at risk. Unaware of the growing catastrophe, headstrong Kate Amaro receives a cryptic message from her father, an aerospace engineer who died one year earlier. Meanwhile, the ruthless Sin Argum of D-Corp attempts to exploit the global evacuation and gain control. With the help of fellow pilot Taft Guardian, Katha uncovers a shocking discovery that may hold the key to saving humanity from the tyranny of D-Corp's evil leader. Don't miss 
uh, Embark Book One, a fast-paced and uh, action-packed space opera epic. You can get uh, all six books in the series currently available in ebook, paperback, hardcover, and audiobook. Except for um, the latest release, Book Six, Fear the Dangerous Night, audiobook is still pending on on that one. You can also pick up in ebook the complete opening trilogy to the Embark series for just three ninety nine in ebook. Right, which is a discount. You can get book one now in ebook for ninety nine sec- uh, cents, and um, book two, Treasure in Darkness, and book three, The Vanishing War, which is an opening complete trilogy. Um, those are both two ninety nine, or you can pick up the box set of the three for just three ninety nine and give and save yourself a bunch of money. So head on over to mynerdworld.net. Links are available right there on the homepage to check out uh, these uh, these books written for my love of science fiction. These are the books. Um, that I would love to see made into a film. If I was going to walk into a theater and watch a movie today that wasn't Star Wars, um, my series of books are the movies that I would want to see. Thank you for everybody who has already purchased the books. And uh, if you haven't already, make sure you leave a review up on Amazon.com, especially for book six. Book six uh, needs some more reviews. So head on over to Amazon.com, search for John J-O-N Justice or MyNerdWorld.net. That wraps up the show this week. Thank you so much for checking it out. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I did recording it. And wherever you are, that you are happy, healthy, and safe. I'm recording this on uh, on Sunday, so if you happen to listen to it on Sunday, happy Halloween and an early happy holidays. We're back next week. The Force will be with you always. My Nerd Road.